welcome to Saving People Queering Things, the Supernatural podcast where we're rooting for the antagonist more than we probably should. Today, we're pulling up to Season 5, Episode 20, The Devil You Know. I'm your host, Elena, pronouns are she, they, and joining me today is lovely guest star, returning host, favorite human, KJ from Supernatural Opinions. Hi! KJ, would you like to introduce yourself to our, our listeners? I feel like I can't top that introduction that you just gave me, but I'm, I'm the host of Supernatural Opinions. I'm the co-host so wayward parents i'm still i'm still hoping like something will happen with wayward parents i know it's like dead in the water hashtag like, <laughs> save the winchesters but like you know i'm just kind of hoping like the winchesters will get plucked out of obscurity and uh onto some network at random but my pronouns are also she they and i'm so excited to be back <laughs> she they gang love it oh this is gonna be a good time today So now that you have met all of us, it is time for us to catch you up. And if you haven't watched Supernatural recently, here is what you've missed on the road so far. Elena is going to recap the show up to this point. Are you ready for that, Elena? (laughs) Well, no, but yes. (laughs) All right. Three, two, one, go. Okay, so Sam and Dean, two brothers, they hunt demons. They've also accidentally kickstarted the apocalypse and are dealing with the aftermath of that bullshit. They're trying to find all of the horsemen of the apocalypse so they can use their rings to basically push Lucifer back into the cave because they let him lose last season and it was a whole thing and uh so Crowley ends up working with them a little bit and is like maybe gonna come back this episode maybe not who knows um and yeah they are really stressed out and Bobby is helping them that was awful oh god (laughs) it got the point across I accidentally started to like talk about the episode of like, no, no, this is not my job. <laughs> course correct. <laughs> course correct is a good term. <laughs> and now KJ is going to recap the episode from this week. Are you ready, my I friend? I think so. <laughs> All right. I am going to count you in. Three, two, one, go. The Winchesters have two remaining horsemen to find pestilence and death. Crowley turns up and promises that he can help them find pestilence. The horseman's demonic and admin assistant is Sam's former best friend from college. And he's also the guy that killed Jessica and orchestrated Sam and Jessica's entire relationship. Sam has some very intense anger issues and emotional regulation issues. Bobby calls him out for it, which I think fuels the fact that Sam continues to be emotionally unregulated as fuck. They kill Brady but they get past one's location and Crowley gets sick of the Winchesters and asks to borrow Bobby's soul so he doesn't have to deal with them. <laughs> Fantastic. Such a good recap. Oh, yeah. This this episode, like, was, I, like, I kind of, I remembered, obviously, that Brady was, like, Sam's friend from college, but I kind of forgot that he was, like, the one who killed Jess and I was like, oh. That's a rough blow. Um, oh. Sam is, I think most people know me um, even over here and, like, no, Sam is my absolute baby. Yeah, I'm going to be honest. That was the reason I was so excited to do this episode just being you because I'm like KJ is like the number one Sam like Sam Winchester apologist and so to have you on an episode where oh he deserves I also all- like Sam the best when he's just like not being super self-righteous and when he is like a little bit like emotionally unstable and this episode really delivers yeah delivers quite the punch <laughs> oh man now it's time for us to pick some music to accompany us on our journey. Here is what we have for this week's episode, Mixtape. KJ, what have you got for um, us? Bullet with Butterfly Wings by The Smashing Pumpkins. Ooh. I just think that, you know, it's got some lyrics that... <laughs> That might be a little bit Sam coded. It, it, there's some stuff about like not being able to be saved and like just kind of like being like manipulated and stuck in, in the path of destiny. And you know, it's very Sam coded. <laughs> it's also like got a very thing. angry vibe and <laughs> being trapped in the throes of destiny. You know, that old chestnut. I think most people probably recognize the song from like it's like hook, like chorus, which is despite all my rage, I'm still just a rat in a cage. And like that felt very like Ooh. Sam in this episode like yeah even when he thought he was out of hunting demons or fucking up his life oh yeah that's that's really a good pick my my pick for this week is a little on the nose in terms of the name of the song <laughs> but the, I promise the lyrics really deliver uh it's demons by imagine dragons solid song <laughs> this one in particular the lines where it's talking about of like that's where my demons hide like they lie inside I was just like oh my god like the demons hide and Brady and I was like <laughs> you know the whole song is about like dealing with your own inner demons and I think that Sam in finding out like oh shit these people that I thought were like my friends and people that I trusted and people that were there for me and like you said in that time where I was away from hunting mm-hmm. were still fucking demonic 
and messing with him is just a lot for him to wrestle with. And I think it kind of brings up that question for him again of like, you know, gosh, am I just, am I inherently evil? Is this just what I'm, is, what's meant for me? And so that's a, that's why that song in particular jumped out to me. It's a it's- great song. Oh, I just remembered that there was a specific lyric in my song I want to talk about. Oh yeah, go oh. for it. <laughs> <laughs> there's a there's like a, a line that goes secret destroyers hold you up to the flames and what do I get for my pain? Betrayed desires and a piece of the game. Oh. <laughs> Ow, my feelings. <laughs> oh. That's nice. Yeah, you know, just just lighthearted fair. <laughs> So now that we have our mixtape playing, it is time for this week's hunt. And today we are exploring the 20th episode of season five, The Devil You Know. This season we have been, rather than doing a theme, discussing each episode through the the lens of a card from the Supernatural Tarot deck. Uh, And this week we're going to be talking about the King of Pentagrams. It's your boy Crowley. Yep, it's your boy. (laughs) I was really excited that, uh, that Crowley was the one on this card. I was so happy to see in this episode i was so happy that he was card i i feel like we've, we've dealt with crowley a few times from what little i remember of season five but like you know he's been around for like 10 episodes because his first episode was 510 but like i feel like this episode was like a big shift <laughs> this is i think only the second episode he appears in oh, so like, I guess, yeah he's new he's yeah, new he's, on the he's... scene and this really set the tone for who he is as a character i felt like yeah he really just well so that thing was with, like the the cult and everything and like abandon all hope like that was it and, like he has not been back since then <laughs> um he yeah he's one of those characters that like he has such an impact on the show that you you assume he's in more episodes than he actually is and then when you look at like how many episodes is mark shepherd in you're like what <laughs> it's wild he's not even here till season five like he just feels like such and and like such a big part of like early season supernatural that like it's wild he's really not actually <laughs> yep nope he does not come in until the tail end of the crypt Kiera. I mean, he was making moves in this episode, though. I feel like he really like jumped in with Buffy. <laughs> he really did. He just he just dove in and, and came for the boys. What's on his card? <laughs> yeah. So the King of Pentagrams card in the Supernatural Tarot deck it describes Crowley is a slick, power hungry demon who's always game for striking a good deal. The King of Pentagrams is a shrewd, business savvy figure who builds a lasting, secure, abundant empire. This tarot card advises you to consider the long term impact of your decision and to focus on setting yourself up future success. In the reversed position, the King of Pentagrams reverse suggests an imbalance in your relationship with wealth. Are you sure you're managing your money well? Have you recently got caught up in materialism? Re-examine your relationship with money and be careful not to let your ego get tied up with your financial status. Wow, Crowley. Yeah. Bro. <laughs> it just screams ya boy Crowley. Um, the the reversed one, I, I feel like doesn't relate as as much but as i was reading the upright position description of the card like this is that was the fact that <laughs> builds a lasting secure abundant empire as we're dealing with nivius which is literally a, an empire that <laughs> is run by demons basically this card just felt very fitting and we, we also like to share uh with this segment a little bit about the the card in the traditional tarot just to kind of see if that you know informs other stuff the traditional rider waith tarot art shows uh, you know, this King of Pentacles. It's King of Pentacles in that deck. And it shows this king just sitting on a throne surrounded by all of their material wealth and things, which, you know, in an episode where Crowley gets to say things like, you know, they took my house, they ate my tailor. Like... <laughs> Just he's a he's a material guy. And uh this this card I think really really depicts that. And the card, as we said, it kind of represents business and leadership and security, discipline. The King of Pentacles sits on a throne embellished with carvings of bulls representing his connection to the astrological sign of Taurus, and grapes and vines adorn his robe, symbolizing wealth and abundance. In his right hand he holds the scepter of his power, and in his left a golden coin, symbolic of his material influence. The king has an innate ability to create material wealth and financial abundance, and better yet, can sustain his wealth over time through self-discipline, control, and leadership. Mm. That last line in particular really reeks of Crowley. This guy is willing to play the long game and do the stuff that other people are not
not willing to do if it means he's going to get to the top. So I think this is a pretty good, a pretty good card to frame our discussion for this week. What was the bit about Taurus? Um, so it shows uh, the throne that he's sitting on in the traditional tarot deck. There's like the head of the astrological sign of Taurus. And so that's a pretty, you know, Taurus typically symbolizes, I don't know, when I when I think Taurus, I think of, of stubbornness is one of the first things. Um, yeah, and Winchester a is, a, is a Taurus. <laughs> He is, isn't he? <laughs> that is a really good connection. I did not even consider. <laughs> yeah, that's that's really fun. Oh, I love that. <laughs> my mom and my brother are both Taurus, so I'm familiar. <laughs> my mom is a Taurus. Yeah, well, like, my mom's on a cusp technically, but oh, I'm a uh, yeah, I'm a cusp baby. I'm a Virgo Libra cusp. But yeah, so that is that's our tarot situation that we're dealing with for this week. So yeah, without further ado, I guess we'll let that launch us into our main discussion. Uh, yeah. What do you think of this week's episode? I was so excited to, be, to that I was gonna get to talk about it because I I love Crowley, I love Sam. <laughs> There was a lot happening. I will say, I will admit, this episode hits different post pandemic. Like, oh, a little bit, yeah. And uh, by a little, and, like, I mean the a lot. Swine flu was my first real pandemic as well. Like, I was, it was like 2010. Swine flu was really big. I was in like late elementary, early middle school. Um, oh, my Atlanta. I was yeah. in college. That's <laughs> fine. And so, like, I, I remember being in like fifth grade ish when swine flu was a few, like a real problem. I remember like getting the vaccine. <laughs> Post COVID though, like swine flu feels like child's flu. <laughs> yeah, any yeah, any like <laughs> when I think back to it, I'm honestly like I don't like it was a big deal. Like the news talked about it a lot, but I don't. I knew like I think one person who got it, and it I think just my teacher might have had it. Um, and like my god sister had it. Like they were both fine. Like they were not. They were really sick, and it sucked. But like as I was hospitalized for the flu when I was a really young child, like I I know like how bad like a flu can like like be yeah <laughs> but just yeah I don't know also I would just like to say Andrew Dab, all these people uh acting in math you, c- you could have figured something out for the finale <laughs> oh my gosh <laughs> Well, they're in their little mess. They're acting. Nothing horrible is happening. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just like, oh, sweet, sweet babies. But yeah, when I, whenever I see you can incorporate safety measures into filming without cutting integral characters from scenes. <laughs> Look at it. <laughs> yeah, it oh, it was so. Yeah, that that element of the episode was so bizarre to me. Like, and we kind of we ran into that when we were talking about uh, the episode the end earlier yeah. this season because it just it hits so much different now. Like the scene with the hoarding toilet paper. Like, like, yeah. like we, the we prophecy was fulfilled. <laughs> It was it's crazy. The way that like Supernatural accidentally prophesied so many things is just very strange to me. The other thing is uh, this doctor lady that they're talking to, she can only say vaccine singular. She's like, we need vaccine. Get us some vaccine. Is it illegal to say vaccines with an S? I think that, I don't think it's illegal, but I think that that is the technical correct term. I did not enjoy it. I don't, I don't like that. (laughs) For some reason, it really grated on me. It was really obvious. And I don't know if it was like, you can tell that she wants to say vaccines with an S. So like, it sounds like she's stopping short, but something about the way she said it really bothered me. Just threw you off. <laughs> Enough that I like wrote a note about it. <laughs> funny. Yeah, I, I forgot how intense this episode was going into it. Like, I forgot how, just how many emotions they put Sam through. Oh my God, poor Sam. My yeah. baby. <laughs> I just wanted to give him the biggest hug and, and mad props to both him I think him and Jensen really went above and beyond with their acting this episode I agree because especially when they get back to the house and Dean is giving him the whole I need you to stay on mission spiel like oh yeah the, the way in which he was like I'm gonna need you to keep it together man like yeah he- I mean I think Jared does angry so often and so well between season four and like seven but yeah like, Jensen really I think just did such a great job <laughs> yeah and especially his his epiphany of you are the one who introduced me to Jess oh like I I feel like I forget that every time I go into this episode and then when he says it I'm like oh oh no oh I forgot that part like I don't know why I just that part always manages to like slip my mind going into watching this episode and so it hurts afresh every single time I do kind of love um I mean like throughout this whole episode Sam's pissed and he's pissed at Crowley and they have every right to be pissed at Crowley like the last time they saw Crowley 
Crowley. They lost Ellen and Joe, which is awful. But like Crowley to me feels like one of the very few characters on this show that immediately has Sam's number. Like a lot of people see Sam and then eventually realize that he's got some deep seated anger issues or that he's like not uh, like a super like stand up guy that he like likes to pretend that he is, which is another thing I love the most about Sam is that he he really believes he's good all the time and like yeah anything contrary to that is just just like such a even when place he's of making denial very for him. questionable decisions yeah like he's just in denial about any questionable decisions he might make but I feel like Crowley like is not falling for that with Sam from day one like he has Sam's number like even just the fact that he like when they get out of the car and they're like yelling at Crowley whatever he only talks to Dean and he like yeah. won't talk to Sam and like Sam's actually still trying to hit him which is usually usually Sam and Dean play that the other way around but like yeah yeah Dean is usually the <laughs> stab first ask questions later but I think but, Sam is still holds so much rage over what happened to Ellen and Joe that he doesn't and, and he also he says this at one point in the episode to Dean he's like the way I trusted Ruby like <laughs> he knows what's at the other end of trusting a demon yeah he is not about to sign him like he I think that's a real moment of growth for him to say that and to show like hey like I've learned like trusting demons screws us yeah. every time so why are we even considering it but you know you've got like Dean who's who's very desperate at this point and like I, I love that Bobby mentions that part too where he's like you know I just got done talking your brother <laughs> off a ledge and now you're trying to say yes like come on boys like Bobby is the underrated MVP of this episode I Bobby, think Bobby Bobby I agree like hands down like he, Sam and me the second that Dean and Crowley leave Sam at that house Sam pulls Bobby to bitch about it. <laughs> Um, which is so I mean Bobby sibling like energy refereeing. yes it's big big like parent child sibling energy <laughs> from that trio and then Bobby's like bro you do not have the emotional control to do what you want to do with this Lucifer situation like yeah. it's an insane plan and maybe you could do it maybe somebody could do it but not you you have intense yeah. problems and this is an archangel <laughs> well, and the thing that's crazy is that it it comes off as very genuine from Bobby even though he's like you can't do this it's not it's not the way that like John would condescend to, to Sam and Dean it's very or even much the way like that a, I think Dean would say like you can't do it's the way he just said like to Sam that he didn't believe in Sam in like point of no return like he was like I don't believe in you like you're gonna say yes to Lucifer and I have to be the one to stop that <laughs> to stop you when you do yeah uh, like uh, yeah I just think Bobby yeah was just trying to I mean to be in Sam's defense some always in Sam's defense Bobby <laughs> has Bobby was is clearly like been drinking during this phone call like he seems a little oh, bit yeah. drunk and he's also like and so is Sam Bobby, yeah they're both drinking and Bobby's like maybe it's time we do some crazy shit and Sam's like oh you want crazy shit I got crazy shit what if I jump in the pit with Lucifer <laughs> <laughs> I he's like know. listen hear me out <laughs> like that was not just like an out of the blue suggestion Sam made it, it did come immediately after Bobby was like let's try some crazy shit <laughs> I'm out of not crazy ideas but and the way that he's just like are you two trying to kill me like <laughs> oh man they are going to put Bobby in the grave like <laughs> the stress alone <laughs> yeah just dad Bobby is always a, a welcome appearance in any episode but he's he's really got the energy of it this one so much so when Crowley first appears in the back of the car um, <laughs> yeah. and Dean just so much drives off the road they get so much better about uh not nearly driving off the road when angels and demons pop up in their car by the end of the <laughs> Yeah, it's a it's a, a learned skill. Um, yeah, um, they haven't learned yet. But Sam fucking stabs the back seat yeah. of the car, like fully, like up to the hill of the knife. And then later, when Dean and Crowley get back in the car with Brady, Crowley starts like carving shit onto Brady with like a knife. And Dean's like, "Watch the upholstery." And I'm like, "Dude, Sam already stabbed a hole in it." Yeah, he Sam really. <laughs> Uh, did you forget the hole that Sam put in the upholstery like two hours ago? <laughs> yeah, I, you know, it may it may be an instance of he was in so much shock that he doesn't rec recall that happening or something. <laughs> That's what I'm going to assume. Either that or he's like already like, told Sam 
replace it. One... <laughs> it's already getting replaced. He might as well bleed on it a little. <laughs> yeah, he's like, I, I would love the the cut scene of like Dean and Sam, and they just like pull over the side of the road, and he's like, he's like, you you hurt the car, you know, it has to happen now. And he's like, <sighs> and it's like, and Dean just gets a full on, just slap him across the face, just once, just like this is what you get for hurting the car. We're, now we move on. It's like a slap bet from like How I Met Your Mother. <laughs> you hurt you, you hurt the car, you get paid in one slap. <laughs> <laughs> honestly i feel like that's a good system for them yeah yeah because then they can move on because dean gets to let his anger out and uh you know sam gets to stab the car <laughs> Sam also like not wanting to hear crowley out when he like promises to help them find pestilence like was exactly uh the same scene as when uh dean and ruby first met when she like appeared in the middle of the road super traumatically and then dean tried to shoot her with the colt yep and sam prevented it like they've done a complete role reversal which is so interesting i love it when the show has those parallels and I would say, like, in Dean's events, he doesn't fully trust Crowley, but, like, Sam didn't fully trust Ruby then either. It's just, like, once you, like, go into a situation with someone and it works out okay, like, that little seed of trust is created. <laughs> yeah. One uh, really goofy line that comes to mind, but it's it's such in such a great scene, is... <laughs> is the bit towards the end when Bobby and Crowley are talking he's like I'm gonna shoot you so full of rock salt you're gonna be like pissing margaritas or something <laughs> like Bobby what even is that sentence honey I mean fair enough Bobby I mean it, Bobby Bobby is here for colorful language but so is Crowley I mean I feel like the two of them are a really great match in that sense like oh yeah and what's it uh, that Crowley says he's like yeah Dean responded with a colorful rejoinder about my corn shoot <laughs> <laughs> I was not mind knowing what exactly was said. I wasn't mind hearing said rejoinder. Let's talk about Brady. That's, uh, do you, do you recall how you reacted like the first time you saw the episode of like finding out that Sam knew him? I don't remember, but like, I feel like it was probably just like shock because like the narrative for the last five seasons has been that was Azazel and like Azazel killed Jess and like that Sam and Jess like meeting was random. I feel so bad for Sam because like not only like was he betrayed by a friend but like the fact that like a demon introduced him to Jess in the first place means that yeah. like that wasn't like, really real either and like nothing's been real and like <laughs> it really yeah it makes them I think call into question like how much of their lives any comfort actually... like that's the only time in Sam's life he's ever had like a comfortable like normal life where he had a home and somebody that like loved him like without any conditions and like he got to do what he wanted in life and oh baby none of it was real <laughs> oh well I mean and that's that's but that's the heartbreaking part it it became real for mm -hmm. him like he really did love Jess and Jess really did love him but it's it it hurts so much because you're like this was all a setup like, yes, you two actually fell for each other, but the plan was make you two fall for each other so that we can hurt you. And, and that's so just graphic. Like, he describes, like, to Sam, like, that, like, Brady was also Jess's friend. Like, she just let him in the front door and, like, she was still alive up until the fire started, which means she was still alive when Sam came home and, like, laid on he the was bed. And, cookies. Like, uh. oh. And, like, Sam came in and he grabbed a cookie off the counter and he laid down and, oh. Yeah. Yeah. And she was alive, like, up until, the, like, the moment that he, like, saw her on the ceiling. She was still alive when he saw her, and oh. It's brutal. It, yeah, it, it's really, it's a huge piece of lore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I know we get to lore a little bit later, but just the fact that it, like, you know, he was just technically Ruby. it's, yeah, because I mean, it's still in a, in a backwards way. It was Azazel because it was Azazel's plan, yeah. but he wasn't the one who pulled the trigger. And I think that that's. And it wasn't just like Azazel dripped some blood in your mouth when you were a baby. It was like Azazel dripped some blood in your mouth when you were a baby. And then like any person you ever knew in your entire life might've been a demon. Yeah. Like, like any fond memory of, of anybody might not be real like not just Jess yeah we can't I can't even imagine else. like what must be running through Sam's head when he realizes that is just like thinking of every friend and teacher that he had through college being like oh my god like yeah I don't do, like, I don't know if you count John's journal I don't know where John's journal falls for you in like canon mm -hmm. but in John's journal um there's a there's like a whole period where some weird shit happens to Sam in like April of 1991 oh. but like Sam almost gets kidnapped by 
his science teacher. What? She's supposed to take Sam to like some science fair and she like kidnaps him and like John and Bobby kind of theorize that like maybe it's Lilith. The teacher's name is Mrs. Lyle. Oh. And so they're like, well, there's like spitballing and there's a whole thing with a psychic and there's a guy named, I think, Alexander or a something. Anyway, there's some dude in a black Seville that's like hunting Sam because he thinks that Sam's dangerous, like kind of Gordon Walker style. Oh, jeez. And yeah, like I'm not as familiar like with John eight or nine Sherman. years old. <laughs> Dean's like 13 and Dean ends up killing this guy. When he's, he's 13? Yeah, because he's going to kill Sam. <laughs> oh my god. It's like, uh, that, it's a it's whole like thing. that line in Dark Side of the Moon. I, I forget how long you've been cleaning up dad's messes. Yeah. Um. So, you know, I mean, I don't really fully consider John's journal canon, but I just think, it, yeah, like this, I would say ties into, into that. <laughs> yeah, that's a really interesting connection because I, I haven't actually read that. I'm, I'm aware of several pieces of the suggested canon from it. Like, I know about the whole Dean's like 16th birthday which makes yeah. set things on fire but it's fine we're not going to get there today it's a it's a difficult read because it's like John's POV because it's John's journal and like sometimes he gets so close to being self-aware about how shitty he is and sometimes he is very self-aware of how shitty he is but he, like he finds an excuse for it it's very frustrating to read <laughs> yeah like I but just it's also think... sad like if there's no point in it that's like a happy read because it's always like I'm miserable the kids are miserable he does this thing where he's always like he counts their anniversary every single year he's like this is what the traditional anniversary gift is for him and Mary and like oh, God. It's so sad <laughs> it's, it's like not a read and like if he ending it just kind of ends at like where season one picks up which is why I don't consider it canon because like if that was what the actual John Winchester's journal said they wouldn't have had to go looking for their dad for a year because the journal basically says where he's going <laughs> yeah that's that's fair maybe maybe it's implied that those pages were ripped out before he left or something um, yeah and like none of the Joe timeline matches up it's fine <laughs> don't yeah, worry about it I mean listen and Supernatural, if nothing else, is is absolutely top tier at disregarding its own canon for the sake of plot devices. But yeah, I, I thought that that was a really, really good reveal. And, and I think the guy who plays Brady does such a good job of like, you know, corporate douche bro, former frat guy. Like, do you know what else guy's been in? No, I don't. Um, so the guy's name is Eric Johnson. Um, he was a major uh love interest in Rookie Blue, which is one of my favorite Canadian propaganda crime dramas. <laughs> It's set in Toronto. It's a very good time. I was gonna say I've never heard of that in my life. It, it's just like a, it's it's a cop show, but it's like set in um in Toronto. It's like a bunch of people who are all rookies. Gotcha. He's also been in the Pretty Little Liars reboot. I think it's the sheriff, which is incredible because he looks like the sheriff, from, like the cop from the original series, like a lot. Like they resemble each other. But his main thing that I think most people pr- would probably know him from if they saw him is he played Jack Hyde, the villain from the second and third Fifty Shades of Grey movies. Oh God. God. Yeah, no, I didn't. He was also in like 24 episodes of Smallville, which I'm guessing is how he ended up on Supernatural. Um, because <laughs> yeah, probably crossover <laughs> on those cast. Yeah, there's a lot of crossover that happens there. <laughs> but I was like, oh, he was like the villain from the second and third movie. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, no, I did not know that. I, he's one of those actors where, like, I saw him. He throws me off because to me, he looks like Army Hammer, and I know he's not, but he, he looks like him. He does. That's exactly. I like. That's what the only reason I looked him up is because I thought he was the cop from the original Pretty Little Liars, and then he was like, "No, he's in the reboot as a cop, but he's not the cop from the first season. He just looks like that guy." That's funny. Yeah, he's just he's very very generic white boy number five, <laughs> but he like I, I, I like it's perfect for a brain character like a guy yeah, like who someone like went to, Brady, Stanford, went to Stanford yeah and I became like a like executive at like a major pharmaceutical company seems right generic white guy number five feels feels right when he does the do the best of someone better like oh my god have the demons been like shown as like really corporate like this before not particularly I think that's something that kind of comes in around the same time as Crowley we start seeing like yeah the corporatization of hell because <laughs> like that it's like been the angels like the angels have kind of been like corporate coded <laughs> yeah yeah the, it's so interesting to me how they do that like both heaven and hell have these weird corporate codings like what I, I... yeah like when I say was in charge I never really got the vibes I think they work I think that they, I think that they get the point across for both on both the angelic and demon side that like corporations are bad like I think that's the whole reason supernatural does shit like that <laughs> yeah entirely which is hilarious coming from the CW but <laughs> Supernatural is is I think largely largely a cab and and 
anti-government, seeing as Sam and Dean are constantly trying to be on the run from it. Interesting take, CW, since he sold out to yeah <laughs> most conservative network. But yeah, you know, it's uh, um, twenty. What was this? Twenty ten? Was this? Yeah, twenty ten was a different time. It was a very different time. God, this episode is thirteen years old. <laughs> oh no, that just gave me a slight crisis. But it's fine. Also, um, when Crowley's like announces to Sam that he's not going, Sam gave him this look, and I was like, is Sam trying, just like maybe like a little bit trying to exercise Crowley with his like dormant psychic powers? <laughs> He's just like kind just of scrunching up his face. I was like, what if you tried though? Like, what if you genuinely tried? <laughs> yeah, brings brings a whole new meaning to the phrase if looks could kill. <laughs> if looks could exercise demons. I feel like Sam's like still like pretty newly sober. Like I know that like season five, like Sam kind of just like gets his like slate wiped clean, but like Yeah, but he also know. just several episodes ago they had the whole thing with famine. Right. Where, so he's like, like not so newly sober. He had a recent relapse. I feel fi- I feel like he maybe wanted to try a little bit. Like, I feel like he was definitely tempted. Also, also, this episode was, I think, really great overall. I think it was really well directed. The sound fixing people need to chill with the car peeling out of somewhere sound effects. <laughs> the car, it was really bad. Like, right before Crowley showed up in their car, they like, came around a corner at full speed and it, like, squealed. And then, like, they peel out of the, like, house that they're leaving Sam at. And I'm like, the car is not actually supposed to make that sound. I get that it sounds cool, but it's old and delicate. You can ease up a little bit. But yeah, it's that's that's where the dra- the dramatization comes in. <laughs> I was just like, you like, don't need to hit the gas that hard. <laughs> yeah, it's like, this is this is slightly unnecessary. By slightly, we mean entirely. We're not in that big of a room. <laughs> yeah, too, too fast, too supernatural. <laughs> fast and the Furious, Dean Winchester drift. <laughs> With the whole Dean and Crowley out on like a little mission to kidnap Brady, it felt a little bit like the demonic, like perversion of like Brady be you and me. Like, you know, it did, didn't it? It had the same kind of vibe. Like Dean and Crowley are off on a mission by themselves and like they're kind of like despite themselves like not having the worst time <laughs> oh, like I love the way that Dean says he's like what can I say like I believe the guy and for that to that phrase to come out of Dean Winchester's face about a demon like who yeah. are you yeah I think at, I think at some point he did realize like oh Crowley actually has put himself on the line like he is not like playing the middle he's not hedging his bets like he is fully in danger if this goes fucking sideways <laughs> yeah and that I think earns Dean respect because he's like look Mm -hmm. like we're we're screwed no matter what we do because the bad guys are after us so if we can get a bad guy to be like you know what i'm with you guys until things go south like that's it's not a bad powerful person to keep around exactly i do wish cast was in this episode this is the third episode of podcasting i've recorded in the last two three days and not a single episode has had cast in it that's that feels like a crime. It does feel like a crime. Where the fuck's the angel? <laughs> the the most important question of Supernatural, where the fuck is the angel? Yeah, because it's really is a demon heavy episode we get here. Yeah, so many demons. I don't even I don't even know where Cass is supposed to be currently. <laughs> yeah. And the the Hellhounds as well. Oh yeah. Actually the Hellhound scene was super well directed. Speaking of like good direction um in this yeah. episode, the Hellhound scene, the, the scenes that were like Hellhound POV felt like a, you like a video game like a cut mm-hmm. scene from a video game in like the best possible way <laughs> yeah they kind of did it, didn't they like it felt like and then you're like it, and then you're gonna cut back to like your regular pov and you're gonna have to shoot all those hellhounds and like not die <laughs> I just love how it's implied how tall Crowley's hellhound is. Yeah. (laughs) Like he goes to pet her and it's like he's just petting like his nose level. I'm like, Jesus Lord, how big is that thing? Bigger than the other one. (laughs) That's for damn sure. Makes lunch out of the other one. Yeah, it was just, it was delightful. Um, And like, and then like, I I think the hellhounds are like some of Supernatural's best work. I like the hellhounds, like that you don't see them. I think that like Yeah, I really enjoyed that too. Really makes them scary, like, because you can't see them and like yeah you're, like you're kind of just left to like imagine like the most massive fucking dog it's one of those things where like it's cool for a bunch of like it's cool for story reasons it's cool for practical filmmaking reasons because it's cheaper to 
set up a couple, you know, practical pyrotechnics to make papers blow around a room or like a drawer shootout than it is to like just have to pay animators to go and do all of that stuff, you know? Yeah. And like, just like, I, I think like just not seeing it, just like, it's the same thing as like the angel wings. Like you only see them like as like a shadow or like when they're burnt onto something, when an angel dies, like you don't see, yeah, you don't see them all the time. So like, you're kind of just like, oh, they're there. And like, then like with the hell hounds, it's like, oh, like you, you don't see a dog. So you don't see like a bad CGI. Cause like, this is, this is from 13 <laughs> years ago. Like the CGI would not have aged super well. Um, no. We would assume like this, the CW. It already budget. does it with what they do, what they do. Yeah. Now. So like the, they wouldn't look good now anyways. Um, But like with like that, like you can imagine how they look and then like having just like some like breath or like a growl or like stuff knocking over, like they go flying through a wall in this scene and like having something unseen come flying through a giant wall like <laughs> just casual things just yeah, it, walls. It, makes it, it makes it more scary <laughs> yeah i it's it reminds me of um the the first in particular the first paranormal activity movie yeah probably scared my pants off more than any other horror film i've ever seen and it was it was for that reason it's because you never see the thing and so that just leaves it entirely to your imagination how scary this monster is and and that just there's something about that that just i think heightens the horror just it's good stuff very good stuff sam has a big like showdown with brady at the end of the episode that was great oh brady yeah gives this big monologue about how sam's like vulnerable demons and like uh, it's it's one of those stabby moments where I'm like, yep, this is warranted. Yeah, it's a it feels like a very warranted stabbing. Like no, everybody is on board that Sam's gonna stab Brady. Like everyone's like, Sam deserves this. He deserves this yeah. revenge moment. Because like as much as I think like the like Gene killing Azazel is like super iconic and all that, like Sam doesn't actually like get his moment of revenge. Like he just stands beside Dean <laughs> while Dean yeah. does it. And, like this felt like actual like Sam's getting revenge for Jessica. Like yeah. I feel moment. like and it gave Sam at least a tiny bit of closure, probably. Yeah. And he spent the whole episode being told to chill the fuck out. And then everyone's like, okay, you made it through. Like, now we don't need this guy anymore. Now you can fucking kill him. We don't care. Congratulations. <laughs> you get to stab someone. You can you can have that anger reaction and it's okay. But also, like, Dean definitely had some internal feelings. He doesn't say anything about about it. But, like, some internal feelings about the things that Brady says and the, the stabbing that Sam does. <laughs> yeah you can tell that dean is trying to hold a lot in to be in order to like be strong for sam which you know is i think what he's he does. worried about sam as he you know as his very in character and as he, i think he should be i think sam is someone to be worried about at the moment but like yeah particularly with like the thoughts that he's having about potentially saying yes which dean does not fucking know about yet <laughs> Yeah, Dean Dean has no yeah, that's true. Dean doesn't know about that conversation. It's just uh the audience, us and Bobby. And then yeah, I did really enjoy that Crowley like went through all of that, like left Sam and Dean with Brady and was like, Yeah, Sam's gonna kill that guy. And then he's like, Okay, well I, I can get them death as well, but I'm done with them. <laughs> yeah. And like goes to Bobby. He's like, I'm not dealing with the Winchesters anymore. Um <laughs> Well, I, I think he he sees he sees an opportunity there to like kind of spread out. I don't know how to word this like just to kind of keep his eggs in different baskets to ensure yeah, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't count on Dean um to not turn on him <laughs> yeah I would also yeah and like if he like he asked for, to borrow Bobby's soul so that's going to give him leverage over Bobby which is leverage over Sam and Dean by extension if, if, like yeah if not more leverage over Sam and Dean <laughs> yeah because I mean, they don't give a shit about both. themselves but they care about their father yeah they would the other one whichever brother did like didn't have their soul in danger that brother would care but the brother whose soul was missing would be mildly annoyed <laughs> Yeah. mildly concerned well and i wonder too, Bobby, they're both gonna go full hard to get bobby's soul back well and i wonder too if like he goes to him because well sam is clearly like off the rails at this point and yeah knows that. and i think there's also the factor of dean having already having sold his soul i don't know if he's like can you do that twice i mean i feel like you get brought back to life by uh an angel i feel like your soul's back up for grabs but like on the other hand i don't know like dean's soul might just be still like permanently marked for hell like well that's you know? depressing implications but like yeah how many times can you sell your soul <laughs> without explicitly getting it back because like we may never know the answer to he sold it i mean on the on the other hand lilith had that contract and lilith's not a problem anymore <laughs> 
that's true. So maybe when the person who drafts up the contract is terminated from their position, all contracts with that person thereof become null and void. <laughs> you know, assuming they haven't already landed themselves in hell. I feel like anybody who hasn't died yet maybe should just get off <laughs> on <Yeah>. a technicality. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's a good question, though. I wish I, I wish I had like a very like genuine, like well researched, certain answer for you, but I just don't think that one exists in case. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't know that there is a, a clear cut answer to that one. Not that the terms of a demon deal are actually super uh, clear or obvious, because like again, Sam should be dead because Dean definitely tried to get out of his deal originally, so <laughs> that should have killed Sam. Yeah, for real. <laughs> <laughs> like he, yeah he tried he spent an entire year trying to get out of it you know it's like yeah. you try to welter weasel your way out like they've been doing it all year are you guys just not paying attention yeah like, like why did you put that clause in if you weren't gonna follow through <laughs> you know they were busy i guess in hell they just had a backlog of things it's like a customer service call center they just got too much going on to be able to handle it hell is a customer service call center i said what i said <laughs> As someone who's worked in a call center before, yeah. Can confirm. Can confirm. <laughs> um, one of the podcasts I listened to, um, the, one of the hosts used to work in a um, like customer complaint call center for like the gas company, or, like the energy company or something like that. And like, he just hated his job. He would just hang up on people, I guess, and just like clicked in and he got pulled into the office one day and they're like, your average call time is five seconds. And he was just like, I'll go pack my stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it's like yeah you can't there was yeah. no justifying that <laughs> it's like i was just sick of being yelled at all the time that's that's funny <laughs> five <laughs> seconds that's like i dialed it and hung up like yep that is all that was happening wow it's crazy <laughs> that they can monitor that sort of thing <laughs> They can. If you work in a call center, um, someone someone can monitor at any time. Well, yeah, because like it's it's weird the, the kind of stuff they can do now. Because like I forget exactly what it is. I probably should know this offhand, case of emergencies. But in at my job at the college, there is a certain combination of keys on the keyboard uh, of every computer that if you hit them at the same time, it will send a notification to campus security and someone will oh, within a minute. That's interesting. I kind of love that. Yeah. I definitely constantly... know what that is so you don't do it by mistake. But yeah, I that's, like and that's what I live do. in fear of. I'm like, oh no, am I accidentally going <laughs> to like call in the National Guard because I sneezed <laughs> and my hand twitched weird? Like, and hit the, It's probably a hard combination to actually accidentally hit, but like that's an excellent feature. Feature. yeah when when my boss told me about it i was like oh I was like, oh, that's efficient well, but yeah you know, i like, know like when i worked at the call center my manager could choose to look at my call log um at any time <laughs> yeah that's that's wild i feel like a performance review with brady would absolutely suck oh yeah i also did love it was it i got a lot of zachariah energy from his interaction with the guy that pissed him off in the meeting when he's like how do you feel about something in upper level management <laughs> communication <laughs> specifically as he th- slits his throat to use it to talk to honestly excellent um <laughs> And yeah, big Zachariah energy. Also, like the whole like, oh yeah, like I'm not doing good enough. Like I'll do the best of someone better. Also felt like when Zachariah got like temporarily fired and then rehired, like mm-hmm. the grovelly like middleman, like the the middle management. That's what Brady is. He's middle management. Like clearly he like works for the Horsemen and like they're in charge. But like yeah, he's also in charge of other demons. <laughs> yeah, well, he doesn't have like a whole lot to be in charge of anymore. Um, nope. Mostly because he's not breathing anymore more but you know good times I feel like that is as good a time as any to wrap our main discussion unless you have any other like major points. No, I feel like that was that was the the hits, the highlights. The... Yeah. So now we're going to head into our going meta section where we are tracking lore, representation, behind the scenes trivia, and more. It's now time for our representation check. R- ch- I have to do it because Noah's not here. He always says <laughs> Noah, I hope I did you proud. We do not pass the Bechdel test. No, I can't think of a single female character in this episode. It's, is the yeah i'm searching the databases oh there's the lady at the beginning who talks about that doctor but that's it she's the only one <laughs> yep and she just she just wants to date vaccine so you if know. they just put one woman in that scene then they would have been good to go like yeah she was she was only talking about vaccine 
<laughs> yeah. How interesting would that have been if it was like a gender swap situation and like Brady was like a woman who was like friends with Jess? Yeah. That would have been interesting. Or Sam's best friend in college was a girl that wasn't yeah. Jess. Would have loved that. I, I'm a big supporter of Sam and non binary lesbian Sam Winchester headcanons. Yeah. I think that they're really fun. Um, so I could I could see that. That would be cool. Also just love to see a couple where they aren't like you can't be a friend of some with someone who's opposite gender. Like you can't be friends with a girl because you're my boyfriend. Like that's so yeah, I've that never, would never be just so it's like it what do you mean been I great. can't have friends like just I just it. feel like that would never be just so I feel like they could have really did something <laughs> it's a fair point in terms of relationship dynamics you know we talked a bit about this already like the the father-son dynamics we've got going on between Bobby and Sam the complication of the brother's dynamic mm-hmm. because this is just a really tense situation for the two of them and Dean is trying to like make sure we stay on target and Sam is obviously at, like very emotionally over overwhelmed yeah i mean rightfully so <laughs> yeah yeah and then like crowley is like kind of their I, w- I wouldn't say that they're friends yet they are not friends but like crowley is is weaseling his way into the family business <laughs> yeah yeah saving people hunting things occasionally working with kings of the crossroad <laughs> which is such a badass title um <laughs> <laughs> yeah i do i do love oh i love crowley so much he's just he's such a delicious villain like some villains on oh, this God. show just come and go and I like kind of forget they have ever existed but then there's you've got these iconic villains like Crowley and just Mark Shepard himself is just fucking awesome. Mark like, Shepard seems like such a delight I've never yeah. met him but he just really does he's, seem delightful. He's really wonderful so get this I was looking into the lore and as as I already said we kind of have a huge piece of lore about the history with Sam and Jess how the two of them came to be together and lose each other which just makes me want to rip it's my so heart sad. out and eat it for breakfast it's rough this is the first time somebody calls sam moose ever uh, i think so yeah i i don't think we get a mention of squirrel though no i think that comes after it's an extension of the moose <laughs> yeah i do i do love that that's his nickname <laughs> And of course we get the hello boys. Like I yes. always love that. Crowley is iconic and delightful. We we truly don't deserve a villain like Crowley. <laughs> <laughs> One smaller piece of lore is the confirmation that uh the horsemen have the same communication system as demons like Azazel. Oh yeah, that's true. Blood in the cup. I like I wonder what the criteria is for that. Like what level demon do you have to be in order to get to the the blood with... cup? Yeah. And what does that like, mean for Meg? Because Meg could do that. Yeah, like at what point do they upgrade you from like an iPhone 13 to like a cup of blood? Like yeah. <laughs> these are the questions I have that keep me up at night. It's a good question to have. <laughs> Maybe not to keep you up at night, but it's a good question to have. These things haunt my dreams. Like also, so many other um, supernatural canon. I don't think we've come across anyone leasing their soul before. I'm assuming ne- next episode uh, we'll yes. get more information about that. But like, very good point. Traditionally, yeah, a soul tra- like a soul deal is like a it's a one way no take backsies kind of like deal. But Crowley's like, I'll give it back. <laughs> yeah, when he when he first said that, I was like, he'll you what? Are you allowed to do that? Is that is, is that, that allowed? Because <laughs> um, we have never once seen that before well we've seen guess... demons give souls back like when they for their very first like hellhound episode like that they dealt with like they like convinced the crossroad demon to like renege on those contracts but like we've never seen someone like come out of the gate with i'll just borrow your soul temporarily <laughs> yeah no that's... that feels like cheating honestly it, like it kind of does i like i always felt a little weird about it and i was i never trusted it fully i was always like what there's a catch here i don't know what it is but it's here but yeah, I'm assuming next week we'll find out what Bobby's answer was to that and more information, I hope. Yeah. As we wind down our episode, it's time for our final and, and probably favorite section of the episode, our character blessing. And uh, KJ, I would love if you would kick off with your with your blessing I, this week. I feel like I don't I'm know so, what to say. I'm, I'm <laughs> going to be so shocked at who you pick. I have truly no clue. Of course my blessing select. is going to Sam. Um, my blessing usually goes to Sam. Of course I will give my blessing to someone else if they need it, but I honestly don't think anyone in this episode needs it more than Sam. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah, he really does. Absolutely. Like no one in this it. episode is more emotionally distraught than Sam Winchester. <laughs> yeah, understandably so. Like he just had his entire worldview shifted. Talk. His friend. And he was a good friend too. Like that was the other thing was like he and Brady were friends and there was the just thing, but also like when Brady started acting really weird and like dropping out of school and like partying yeah. and a bunch, Sam was like, oh no, like let me help you. Yeah, like because it makes me wonder like what was their guy like what was their relationship like before brady was possessed like did they like meet the first week of on campus were they roommates like Probably they were like oh it's just so sad because like that he was like a good friend too like on top of everything oh sam he's just a is... nice little guy <laughs> he's he's just such a, a good little big guy <laughs> and we we love him for that that's a really good blessing my blessing this week is actually going to go to Bobby. That Bobby could use the backup. <laughs> yeah, because he's, oh, he's stressed out because his, you know, uh, like he says in the episode, he just got done talking one of his surrogate sons off of a ledge and now the other one is he's on the you know, same ledge. <laughs> he's on the exact same ledge and it's like, hmm, but, but what if dad? And he's just like, eh, please stop trying to give me a hernia. I'm already dealing with enough medical problems. And that's when the king of the crosses shows up and tries to start making deals with you like yeah he's in a very vulnerable place i think after that called sam yeah and also so, like he's just been going through a rough time generally like yeah well because he, he even says it he's like yeah you know like I, I managed to get control sure but then i shanked myself like yeah also like when dean was on that ledge bobby straight up was like yeah i think about like unaliving myself every day and yeah he's not in a good place i feel like yeah this is a lot for <laughs> they really need to stop dumping shit on Bobby. <laughs> yeah, like, Bobby needs a really good vacation, like, full full spa treatment. Like, I'm talking about, like, that kind of therapy where they bury you in the sand or, like, one of those, like, Korean Yeah, when they're post-apocalypse, Bobby deserves, like, the best, like, weekend away that they can fake credit card themselves to. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm ready for, for Bobby to get a chance to relax at a spa. <laughs> Blessings to Bobby. And that is all we have for today. Uh, KJ, thank you, my dear friend. It was so lovely having you on again. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Is there anywhere on the internet that people can find you and your stuff that you can direct? Yeah. I mean, Supernatural Opinions is available probably wherever you're listening to this right now. Um, all the podcast <laughs> places. Um, and I'm on TikTok at SPN Opinions KJ. And for now, still on Twitter at SPN Opinions Pod. It really does feel like that now, right? Like, uh, for now, it's we're on Twitter still. Yeah. I'm not, I haven't moved to <laughs> any of the other places yet it's so, like I'm like really just here like going down with the ship <laughs> You know, I, I've been feeling that a lot as well. I did sign up for the that Hive one and was like, eh, like I was into I have not days. used Hive once. Um, I signed up in the last round of Exodusing, but like I didn't sign up for Threads or whatever other ones but are currently going around. I did sign around. up for Threads and I do kind of like it, but I think the biggest reason I like it currently is because it's so new that there's no bots yet. Uh, yes, that, um, that does seem nice, but that, that will change drastically, I feel like. Yeah, it will. And so I'm just trying to enjoy that like era of a new social media platform before it gets stupid uh, but yeah still on twitter for now and probably will be until it completely dies or it's actually just unusable or like just completely like elon musk like alt-right nazis <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, thank you for sharing all of that. Also, just as a as a reminder for folks, uh, we do have a giveaway that is running currently uh, where you can win a really lovely little uh, like cassette pouch that's made by the one and only August, one of our hosts. So if you want to get more information about that, you can check out our website, queeringthingspodcast.com, or you can also just check out any of our social media platforms where that giveaway is running. We also have a, upcoming soon a special bonus episode episode in which Noah and Jamie, Jamie of Driver Picks the Podcast, join forces to chaotically discuss the Kripke era. And so we highly recommend you checking that out on your preferred podcasting platform when that drops. Knowing Noah and Jamie, I'm sure it is truly chaotic. <laughs> oh yeah. The amount of chaos energy <laughs> contained within that episode might might solve all the world's problems, just maybe. <laughs> 
also out now, Queering People Saving Throws. Our main crew, along with KJ, are taking a dive into a queer D&D adventure, releasing every other Friday right here on our feed. Make sure you're subscribed to Saving People Queering Things wherever you listen to podcasts and share the show with your friends. And you can find links to our social media and join our Discord server through our website, queeringthingspodcast.com. And if you're all caught up on Supernatural and want to go back to before the beginning or after the beginning, depending on how you feel about this. Yeah, depending on where you are in the Manchester's journey. <laughs> um, you can listen to August and Lena along with Beth and me over Ooh. at Wayward Parents. And uh, we're at Wayward Parents on Twitter and Tumblr at Wayward Parents Podcast. And be sure to ride along with us next week as we explore the penultimate episode of Season 5, Two Minutes to Midnight. Thank you all for coming along for the ride and we wish you a peaceful road until we meet again.